Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming, week 12 Friday, um, to hear this talk. So, this talk is about succinct proofs for scaling blockchains. And we're going to make more sense of this title as we go along. So, let's just get right into it. So, the first thing I want to ask to get a sense is how many people know what a blockchain is? A show of hands. Yes, confidence, yes. Okay, there's about about half the room. So who's confident enough to kind of take a step at defining it? Anyone want to throw out some suggestions? Okay, if not, <laughs> then I'll just give a technical definition of it. So a blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer replicated state machine. And what, so you guys are aware of what a state machine is? Yes, okay, so it's a, it has a set of instructions, it takes in some input and it has some state and based on the input and the instruction, it changes the state. Um, so that's why it's called a state machine. So this state machine in a blockchain is basically keeping track of a ledger. So it can be a ledger of unspent transaction outputs like in Bitcoin, or it can be a ledger of accounts and account balances like in Ethereum for example. So that's called the state of the blockchain and it's replicated across all the nodes of the blockchain. So everyone who's running a Bitcoin node for example has to agree on the current state of the whole network. And it's peer-to-peer -peer because anyone can run a node so it's not the case that we are all looking to a central node and querying it for the current state but we maintain a local copy of the state. So the thing is um, about such a peer-to-peer -peer replicated structure is that it's very hard to scale. And that's because every full node is required to do a lot of computation. So they first need to maintain full state. They need to maintain a full set of transactions. And they need to validate all the transactions by executing them. So this is a lot of memory, it's a lot of computation, and this also means that the network is basically limited to what the weakest node can do. So the rate at which the weakest node can process and execute these transactions, and how many transactions the weakest node can store. Um, so if we want to naively increase the transaction throughput, we can just say, oh, we'll decide to put more transactions in each block. But that will lead to fewer and fewer nodes being able to keep up with this block size. And so that will lead to your blockchain becoming effectively more centralized to those with enough computing power. So that's a naive solution to scaling the blockchain. And this talk will be about looking at other ways of scaling the blockchain that still allow it to be decentralized. So. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of sharding. So sharding is a very common thing in distributed systems. It's basically um, splitting the state of the system into several different parts. And we no longer require every node to know about the full state, but instead we only require each node to know about the part that it's responsible for. So instead of maintaining full state, it maintains partial state. It maintains only a partial list of transactions, and it only needs to process, process a partial list of transactions as well. Um, so for extra reading, you can, oh, these links might be a bit dated, but you can basically just Google <coughs> blockchain sharding. I saw that Zilliqa, for example, had come to NUS hackers before, so they, they're very, they have a great sharding solution. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what's known as layer one scaling because it splits the actual blockchain. But the talk today is not about layer one scaling. It's going to be about layer two scaling. So who here has heard of this concept of layer two scaling? Right, so layer two scaling is a different approach than layer one because what it tries to do is take computation off the blockchain, so onto a second layer a higher layer um, and naively you can think of it like a, 
a side chain. So this is your main, say, Bitcoin blockchain. And um, you, with one transaction, you transfer an asset to a side chain. So for example, you trust some moderator to run their own um, private blockchain and you trust them to basically recognize this transfer onto their chain. And what's good about doing your transactions on this private chain is that basically, for example, only one person is in charge of maintaining the state, executing the transactions, and they can do it as fast as you want for as cheap as you want. And there's no burden on, say, thousands of peers to replicate this state and to agree on the same state. So it's going to be fast and cheap on this side chain. And when you've done all the business that you need to do, you can simply, with one more transaction, push the state back on chain. So if you count the number of on chain transactions, it's only one and two. Yeah. So this is a nice solution because, as I mentioned, the person running this side chain has to be trusted. Um, yeah. That's the problem with this solution. And so we need to trust that all these transactions here were basically performed in a valid way, meaning that this person did not do anything malicious, did not insert any double spend, did not drain the balance of some unsuspecting party like and transfer it all to their own account. You know, all this we have to have faith, in basically, in whoever is running this side chain. So that's not very nice. When we outsource our computation, we want to be fairly confident that it was carried out according to our wishes. And in other words, that the state transitions are valid. But <laughs> the point is that we do not want to redo the whole computation ourselves. So. We can check the state transition is valid simply by replaying all the transactions that happen on this side chain. But that would defeat the purpose. We would still be doing the same amount of work that we would have done on the main chain. So we want to be lazy, but we also want to be able to have confidence that um, our instructions were carried out. So a few, so there are two classes of solutions to this. Basically two ways of putting constraints on the operator of the side chain um, to make sure that they behave. The first, which we will not discuss today, is called fraud proofs. So there's this whole group of people in the blockchain world who work on Plasma. It's a cool sounding name, but all it means is that basically when the operator of the side chain submits the state back to the main chain, um, we open a challenge period and anyone can submit a proof that something wrong has been done and, and that some, some part of the state is not as expected. So this, this still saves on computation because we um, uh, basically it's innocent until proven guilty. So only when we have some cause to suspect the operator do we need to do any work and um, submit the challenge. And even when we submit this challenge, it's only one um, transaction on the blockchain. So it still does save computation. Um, but complexity can arise with fraud proofs when, for example, you consider all the situations, all the challenge games um, that can happen. Um, and actually, it's very game theoretic. Um, and people have also started using predicate logic, for example, to better define these games. So that's one, that's one way to keep the sidechain operator honest. Um, the, other, the other approach is validity proofs, and this is what we will discuss today. So validity proofs basically make it such that the operator cannot commit a mistake. So fraud proofs are such that the operator can commit a mistake but can be caught. Validity proofs are such that the operator cannot even commit a mistake so that it is not possible for the operator to make an invalid state transition. Yeah. If, if for fraud proofs, right, then couldn't, if in order to detect a mistake, wouldn't you have to do the computation yourself? Yeah, so for fraud proofs, um, 
you can think of it as kind of Oh, the question was for fraud proofs to detect the mistake, wouldn't you have to do the computation yourself? And the answer is yes, but you would only have to keep track of your own assets, basically. So whereas if everyone was on the main chain, everyone would need to keep track of everyone else's assets as well. Whereas for fraud proofs, you only need to, for example, observe your own coin's history and basically listen for any anything that's going wrong um anything unexpected yeah so it still does save um yeah any other questions before we move on okay so yeah today we're going to talk about validity proofs and we're going to talk about them um by exploring this construction called roll up so as I said, uh, roll-up is, it takes the approach of validity proofs, meaning that at each state transition, at the time of each state transition, um, the operator has to prove the validity of um, their actions. So this is roughly how it's going to work. So we have state one, um, this is on the blockchain, and then um, off-chain we have uh, this is the side chain basically. So on the side chain, people are submitting transactions very cheaply to some central coordinator or operator. And what happens here is basically that the operator has to take all these transactions, process them, and at the end of this process, produce a succinct proof that he actually executed these transactions according to some predefined rules. So this succinct proof is actually a mathematical object that we will explore in the next few slides. But let it be said that this succinct proof is desirable because it is um, very cheap to verify. So after, after the succinct proof is produced, the operator has to submit it to the main chain and the main chain will verify it cheaply and um, only if this verification passes will the main chain allow state one to transition to state two. So this is basically what we're trying to do. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so Basically, it's called succinct because, as I said, verification is efficient. So, verification is actually constant. Yeah. So, it doesn't depend on how many transactions you have. So, it's a constant verification time. And, yeah, if you recall, this fulfills our objective of not wanting to recompute anything, everything. So, instead, we only need to compute this tiny verification, right? So, let's see. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone watch Silicon Valley? <laughs> yeah, so, um, basically, what if I told you that for any program of arbitrary length with an arbitrary number of inputs, we can produce a proof that is constant size, the proof itself is constant size, and its verification is also constant time. That, that would be amazing, right? Yes, that's what we can do. So how we do it, how we create a succinct proof is using this mathematical construct. So ZK snarks, have people heard about zero knowledge proofs? Yeah, so this is one type of zero knowledge proof. Yeah, zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge, ZK snarks. Um, and there are a lot of ZK snark constructions. So the most efficient one known today is Groth 16 by Jans Groth in 2016. So as I said, um, this is a constant size proof that can be verified in constant time. So given a circuit um, that defines the set of computations you want to follow, given a set of public inputs which are your transactions, and a set of expected public outputs, a prover can convince a verifier that they know a set of intermediate gates 
um, which satisfy the circuit. So we're gonna we're gonna explain this um, in the next few slides. And what's important for us here is that this is succinct. Um, and it actually also has some other nice qualities. So for example, zero knowledge, meaning that uh, the prover can actually conceal um, however many inputs they want um, and still convince the verifier uh, that uh, their computation was valid. Um, and this should also be sound, meaning that um, no incorrect proof should pass the verification. Of course, complete, meaning that a correct proof should always pass the verification. So I will mention here that soundness is probabilistic in growth 16 and in most um, zero knowledge constructions. And this is because of some information theoretic magic. We'll go into it later. Meaning that there is a chance um, an arbitrarily small chance that an incorrect witness can still pass a verification. Yeah. Any questions before I move on? Yeah. As in the probability that it's still an uh, incorrect witness will pass the verification, is it dependent on the size of the input? Uh, No, no, it's not. Um, I think this actually, uh, actually, good question. I'm not sure if we can define it in our implementation, but I don't think it's dependent on the size of the input. Yeah, but if you guys want to look up the Groth 16 paper, it's a well written paper. Mm. So let's go more in depth into what this proof is actually doing. So as I mentioned before, our circuit defines a set of rules that we want to follow. And over here you see that they're quite reasonable rules. So for example, if we want, if Alice is sending an amount of money to Bob, we need to check that, for example, Alice signed the transaction check that Alice is a, a, a real account, check that she has enough money, um, and all these basically sanity checks. But if we don't perform these, then the operator can get up to all kinds of mischief. For example, if Alice is colluding with the operator, she has zero balance, but she still sends some money to Bob, and the operator credits this um, out of thin air, for example. So. So this is, this actually is very close to the state transition function that is defined in Bitcoin. Yeah, but the point being, we're stuffing it all into this circuit. We're not going to perform all these on chain. Instead, we are, uh, we're, we're compressing it into a succinct proof. So you, you, you also see that um, we have a set of inputs that go into this circuit. So with every new batch of transactions, these inputs will change depending on who's sending how much to whom. Um, and as I mentioned just now, you can choose to keep some inputs private and some public. Um, so for our case, it doesn't really matter. We were not really concerned about privacy, but there are other projects who focus on privacy and for example, they want to keep the they want to keep the identity private, or they want to keep the amount sent private. Um, that's an option in zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. So I have a couple of slides that actually walk through Graph sixteen, and it's very mathematical. And I don't think I will go through them today. Um, because I gave this talk a few months ago and <laughs> I, I think this is the part where I lost everyone. Um, I recommend you guys to read this on your own, but on the big picture level, basically we start with an arithmetic circuit 
and express it as a rank one constraint system. So it's almost like a, a pictorially you can think of a set of wires with inputs and outputs. And then we express the rank one constraint system as a quadratic arithmetic program. And all this is to massage it into a, a form that's amenable to a succinct proof. So, and then from quadratic arithmetic program into a non-interactive linear proof, and finally to a SNARK. So, um, yeah, like I mentioned, please read this on your own if you're interested. Mm. And just quickly, um, yeah, what we covered just now from uh, the arithmetic circuit to the SNARK is actually all the prover's job. Um, before the prover can start doing this, um, this SNARK, this particular construction requires a common setup. Um, and the point of the setup and the proving is that this is where all the computationally intensive work happens. So all this work is done, basically to comp compile a huge program into a tiny proof. And it's, all this stuff is known as pre-processing. And we do it so that by the time we reach verification, there's very little left for the verifier to do. Yeah, so verification requires um, very, very few, uh, not a lot of information and not a lot of computation. Yeah. In standard zero knowledge proofs, right, the verifier has a choice to ask whether you want to perhaps either A or B. That's usually how it works. But so if they're given the negation, won't the prover have to reprove every single instance? Verifier asks A or B. Okay, I think I know what you're referring to. So for example, probabilistically checkable proofs are when the verifier gives a challenge to the prover and the prover needs to basically compute the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So, what was your question again? Okay, if you, if a typical zero knowledge proof yeah. setup, you would have your the verifier or this challenge of in some sense issue. So, sure. in some sense, but usually the, it requires a new proof every time the verifier issues a challenge. So, this wouldn't that be computationally demanding? Uh. Okay. Mm. This. That's how, in theory, a zero-knowledge proof works. So what we are doing here is, an, uh, so this is called a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So what you described just now is an interactive oracle proof. Yeah, so basically uh, the, the verifier asks a question, the prover answers it. And instead of doing that here, we pre-compute all the questions that the verifier can ask. So, and this is random, randomly computed. And so the prover um, knows all the questions and, and has to answer all of them correctly. But the prover doesn't need to engage in this song and dance with the verifier, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that's why it's non-interactive. Um, yeah. Okay, so that was basically the math behind compiling a program, a large program into a small proof. And now we're going to show you how we use it in this particular construction on the blockchain. So, yeah. We call it rollup. Um, so we've seen this diagram before. Yeah, basically what we described just now is from this uh, circuit to this small proof and we also describe this verification so how we're going to use this oh. so oh yeah this is how we're going to use it on the blockchain so is everyone familiar with a merkle tree a merkle tree is a binary tree um, where all your leaves um, represent basically the state you're interested in. And as you go up the tree, you 
hash together um, the children and you, you repeat this until when you reach the top you get a, a hash that represents the state of the whole tree right so and this is a very nice sort of accumulator because if one if the state changes in one of the leaves um, this state root will change right so we can use a Merkle tree to represent our state um, and each leaf is an account with some balance and nonce so the nonce is just an index counting the number of transactions you've made this is a simplified version of the Ethereum state. Um, so we've defined our state, and on this state, we would like to perform some valid transactions, some valid state transitions. So these, uh, a valid transaction is basically what we defined earlier in our circuit. And after a valid transaction is executed, we get we basically go from an old state to a new state. We in a valid state transition. So we'll go through one example of how this is done. So Bob is sending one dollar to Alice. You can see Bob's leaf over here and Alice's leaf at the extreme left. So we receive this transaction from Bob, right? The first thing we do, we're the operator. First thing we do is we check that Bob signed it. So this is a ECDSA algorithm. And we check that Bob actually exists in this state tree. Yeah. So to check that Bob exists, what we do is we require a Merkle proof from Bob. So a Merkle proof is basically all the nodes and inner nodes necessary to hash from Bob up to the state root. Yeah, so Bob needs to, along with his transaction, give us these three nodes. And we hash it ourselves, and we, I mean, we better get the state root that we expect. So, any questions, by the way? Okay, so once we're satisfied Bob exists, we check that his balance is enough, we check, and after this check, um, we're happy to actually update Bob's account. So how we update Bob's account is, we, deb uh, we debit $1 from his balance, we increase his nonce by one, and then we use the old Merkle proof that he gave us to do that same hashing and get this time a new state root, right? So, and then we need to basically do the same thing for Alice. And I will not bore you with that. It's exactly the same thing. We check Alice exists. Um, we check, we update Alice's account. And then once again, we use Alice's Merkle proof to update the state root one more time. So we've done two updates of the state root. Yeah, that's one transaction from Bob to Alice and the operator can perform an arbitrary number of transactions like this. Um, yeah. And still get a constant size proof. So for this Merkle proof, right? Yeah. So whenever the, in this tree updates, don't you have to inform the individual leaves of the change of your address of the tree? Yes. So basically what you've seen is one transaction from Bob to Alice. And then let's say C and D also want to perform a transaction. So they have to, um, how do we do this, sorry. Um, right, so it actually has to happen on the operator's side. So the operator needs to keep track of basically which, basically the state root and which inner nodes have changed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So as you can see, we do rely on the operator to be honest and to 
keep good track of the state. But the caveat here is that if the operator is not honest or is very disorganized and cannot produce the right proofs, then there is no way that he can pass the verification. So yeah. Mm. So these are the, once again, the constraints that our circuit has. So this is what we're gonna, we'll represent as an arithmetic circuit, compound to SNARK. These are the inputs and outputs. Um, and as I mentioned, if you're very privacy conscious, you can choose to reveal only the minimum of information. Uh, just to check, <coughs> so yeah. that is the minimum information. There's no smaller. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's the minimum information because. Yeah, the state rule is. Yeah, necessary. so the we want to keep the state route public mm -hmm. because the verifier actually needs to check that the the proof is transitioning from the current state route to the newer claimed state yeah. route. Yeah. And this is useful for basically anyone who's keeping track of the public blockchain um, to perform their own sanity checks. Um, yeah. But you're welcome to think of other constructions that save on the number of inputs. I mean, something interesting about public inputs is the more you have, the more expensive it'll be because you actually need to publish this information on chain. Whereas if your inputs are private, no one needs to know about them. And so you don't push that information onto the chain and that saves you some co cost. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, hmm. So this goes into detail about how, yeah, about how the circuit, um, yeah, basically this is graph 16 again. Uh, you can see why it's constant size. Um, each proof basically consists of three group elements. Um, and then, yeah, so it's always three group elements. Yeah. So Yeah, you can see here that um we're using the fact that this state route is public to allow the smart contract to basically transition from one valid state to another. Um, yeah, so that was all describing transactions um, in rollup. But the question, one question you might have is, how do we enter this system? Like, how do we go from the chain? How do we deposit assets into the chain and see them appear um, on the operator's side? So how we do it is we actually want um, these assets to be on-chain. So they're real assets, for example, Bitcoin or Ether. Um, and so we actually deposit them on-chain into, uh, into a smart contract. And we keep track of the people who've entered the system on the smart contract. So within a smart contract, we are actually hashing together deposits as they come in. Um, yeah. So each time someone deposits, we add a leaf to this deposit tree. And with this, um, the state root of the deposit tree keeps track of the number of people who have entered um, your roll-up system. And to withdraw, we basically define withdraw as a normal transaction, except that it's going to uh, a zero address. And when this 
when the sender publishes this withdraw transaction, the smart contract can check that its recipient is the zero address and then credit the real asset on chain back to the person. So they basically exit your system. Right. Um, if you guys want to see a demo of this, I, I can send these slides around later. Um, basically, oh, you can play it. So, Have you guys used Ethereum applications before? Okay, so, hold on, let me just read one. Oh no! Okay. So what we see here is um, someone depositing, oh we don't, someone depositing money into the system and then uh, performing a transfer and then withdrawing their money back out into their account. So you can see that deposit and withdraw are actually on chain. So you need to unlock your Ethereum account to actually do these transactions. And you can see that the transaction went through on the blockchain. So that's basically roll up, and that's how we outsource computation um, in a succinct way to reduce our computation cost on the blockchain. Some considerations, because this is not the only construction out there. So this construction is useful in particular if you want to prove the same constraints multiple times. And that's because if you recall, we have a very intense set up pre-processing phase, so set up improving. And if each time you plan to change your circuit and change the rules of your state transition, then you need to perform a, a, a costly pre-processing for each circuit, basically. So this is only suitable if you plan to stick to the same set of constraints. Um, and Another consideration is the prover needs to do a lot of work. So this is not the most democratic solution. So you, you most likely want to outsource it to someone with a big server, basically. Um, another consideration is that the setup phase is actually trusted. What this means is that it contains some information that the prover can use to make invalid proofs. So this is known as toxic waste. So projects who actually carry use ZK Snarks in production, what they do is they do the trusted setup and then they destroy all the information from it. And some there's this project called Zcash, they have a public burning ceremony. They take the laptop and they smash it and burn it to show that they got rid of toxic waste. So yeah, but if you don't trust that, um, then that's a consideration to have in mind. Um, there are other constructions that are not Groth 16, which do not have trusted setup. So the prover can never make um, an invalid proof. Right. And the last consideration here is that it's not quantum safe. Yeah, so it assumes that the discrete log problem is hard. And um, the answer to this consideration is another construction known as Stark's succinct, transparent um, arguments of knowledge. Mm, so you can check that out. Yeah. Basically, um, I, I would say cryptocurrencies have revived interest in zero knowledge proofs. And so in the past few months and years, a lot of new constructions have come up that do not have trusted setups that are quantum safe. So it's a very exciting time to be working on zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. So 
there are some future directions that um, oh this slide is a little bit outdated um, but basically this construction can be applied to more than just layer 2 so for example it can be applied to communications between blockchains it can be applied to light clients or stateless client models um, and there's also a sort of there's also a class of snarks called recursive snarks where basically within a snark you can prove a snark yeah so you get even more savings um, if each time each time your proof gets way smaller so um, there's a project called Coda that actually has implemented recursive snark Yeah, that's all. Um, I want to say that um, I'm interested in anything to do with P2P privacy cryptography. So if anyone else is interested in this and wants to work on a project together, please talk to me. Um, yeah, I do work with the Ethereum Foundation, but I'm a physicist by training. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in exploring this P2P cryptography space, not just blockchains either. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Yeah. So when you say the proofs are three, ele three elements of the proof, are they three like numbers or? Yes. What are they specifically? Uh, they're group elements. So, you're familiar with group theory? Yes. Right. So they're just elements in a Which certain group. group. Uh. It has to How be. Large are these yeah, it has to be a group of unknown order. If I'm not wrong, over a prime field, you can you can look up the specific group um, in the paper. Yeah. Sorry. Most groups are p groups, so it's not saying much if it's over prime. Yeah. True. Um, you mentioned like recursive uh, ZK snaps, right? Yeah. Uh, are there any drawbacks to this? Because it looks like we're having a lot of free lunch with it. Oh, um, yes. Uh, I think the drawback, so basically, Groth16 is a pairing based ZK snark. So basically they use an, a pairing operation on elliptic curves. So if you want a recursive snark, you need to find a curve that can basically support uh, pairing operations of another elliptic curve. And these are few and far between, these elliptic curves. I think they're called MNT curves. Yeah, so uh, the kinds of computations that you can define are also more limited. Um, recently, Zcash came up with a construction called Halo. Uh, so Halo is supposed to be, yeah, recursive zk snarks. Um, but their paper doesn't have any proofs yet. So the construction is there, but the proofs have not been done yet. Yeah, but definitely a lot of people are looking into this at the moment. Mm. What's the complexity of the prover in okay. generating the proof? Mm, I can say very high, but <laughs> let me see. <laughs> I'm trying to get back to those mathematical. Okay. Yeah, the reductions. <sighs> yeah, you can see here. So. Very high. That okay. The yeah. The it's idea is polynomial, right? I presume. Sorry. It's polynomial, right? Not exponential. Uh. How do you guys are partners, right? So, the exponentiations. 
Here? Maybe the Falcon Black. Oh, it's polynomial. Right? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. If it's polynomial, the proof, then there's no hardness in it. That's how I assume that's what you meant by discrete dot hardness. No, I don't. It shouldn't be impossible to prove. Yeah. It's fine. Multiplication is polynomial, but uh, factoring is presumably hard. Right. So that's what you're exploiting, right? Right. Doing discrete logarithms. Yeah. Probably more than like quartic or cubic kind of complexity. Mm. Number of transactions. No. It yeah. It, I mean, it definitely the complexity of the prover goes up with the number of transactions. Right. Yeah. But the size of the prover. Can they look at like making making it simpler to prove and reducing the computational overhead? So if. The Wait, is it most efficient? Right. What does that mean? Is it most efficient in terms of computation or the size of the proof or? So yeah, the size of the proof. So this, so most efficient the meaning proof. most efficient verification. Ah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, because these sorts of constructions are concerned with outsourcing computation sure. and letting more limited clients basically verify Kind of a trade-off, right? Likely. So if the prover has to do a lot exactly of work, that, yes. Then maybe that might not make sense. You might use a lot of energy to do this work on the prover side. Yeah, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But in some sense, well, there's no good metric of most efficient in terms of the proof size, right? Because PCP tells us you only need three bits. Mm, right. Yeah. So this is definitely bias to the verifier. Okay, thank you.